Well, welcome everyone for joining us this morning on this, hopefully what is going to turn out to be a really nice Saturday morning. Um, so we appreciate you joining us for the Colorado Landscape Basics Q&A session with the experts. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Ken Bennett. He's got a few words he wants to say, and then we'll um, hear from our water and sewer board, and then we'll jump right in and, and get started. So Ken, you. you're welcome. And, uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, my name is Ken Bennett. I'm the Mayor Pro Tem on the Windsor Town Board. And, uh, you know, I've spent most of my life, almost all my life living in Colorado. But I always tell people I grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in Ohio. And if you're familiar with that area of the country, you know that in many times we actually have too much water. If you grew up here or if you've moved here, we quickly learn how scarce and pressure water is here in the West. Uh, that's why I appreciate so much the uh, Colorado Landscape Basics, this, these programs that people could access uh, in the work of our Water and Sewer Board and the subcommittee that has public outreach and public education. It was the Water and Sewer Board plus some other citizens have been participating in that. And, you know, we have huge regional water issues. Um, I always tell people when we look at that snowpack up there, which we need more of, uh, but that snow is not all ours. Uh, that is water that provides water for seven different states, including Mexico. We have huge regional issues. We also have very complex state and local water challenges. That's what's great about this program though, is that it helps people like me and individuals know what I can do on a daily basis to use water more wisely and to make a difference. And so that on behalf of the town of Windsor, I wanna give a big thank you to all of you organizers the presenters, the, the water and sewer board, and especially to all of you who are participating. So with that, I'd like to introduce the chairman of the Windsor Water and Sewer Board, Mr. Greg Blasky. Thank you, Ken. Amy, do I have to switch to my video? I still see Ken. Good morning, my name is Greg Polowski. I'm the chairman of the Windsor Water and Sewer Board. As a representative of the town of Windsor, I'd like to thank Amy Lentz, Allison O'Connor, and Tony Koski of Colorado State University for your excellent presentations and your time. Your presentations help us to be more water wise. Every time I hear you all speak, and I did listen to all three of the presentations, I learned something new. And despite the recent big snow that we've had here in Larimer and Weld County, we are still experiencing some level of drought. We need to keep water conservation a priority in our thinking. To help with continuing to be mindful of water conservation, the upcoming month of April is the mayor's water challenge across the entire United States. Our mayor, Paul Rennemeyer, has joined Windsor in this national Mayor's Water Challenge. Windsor, Windsor is competing in April against cities all across the U.S. to see which cities can have the highest percentage of their residents take an online pledge to conserve. And if you would, please consider signing up to take the pledge at mywaterpledge.com beginning on April 1st, but not before. Again, that is My Water Pledge without any periods or spaces followed by .com. There's more information on the Town of Windsor website. It's actually on the banner page of the Town of Windsor website. Again, thank you, Amy, Allison, and Tony. I'll now turn it over to Amy, who is going to be the MC for the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. All right. Can you see that okay? Is everything looking all right there? I can't see you guys. That's great, Amy. Say. Great, yeah. okay. All right, so as I mentioned, welcome. We are here to answer your questions um, about the, either about the videos that we posted on YouTube on lawn care, trees and shrubs and water wise landscaping or any other horticulture questions you might have, we can answer those today. Um, but I'm joined by a couple of my colleagues and I wanna take a minute to introduce them. Um, Tony Koski, Dr. Tony Koski is our CSU turf specialist um, and he is gonna be covering the lawn care questions today. 
Dr. Allison O'Connor is our Larimer County Extension Agent for Horticulture, and she's going to be covering trees and shrubs. And my name is Amy Lentz. I'm with Weld County Extension. Um, I'm the horticulture and agriculture agent there, and I'll be covering the water-wise landscaping. So um, hopefully you enjoyed those videos. If you didn't get to watch them, they are posted on the Windsor um, on the Windsor Town's website under, I think it's Project, I want to say Project Connect, I could be wrong on that, um, but we'll get those to you in the chat. I'll put those links for you in case you didn't get a chance to watch those. Um, we are going to leave those videos up so you can watch them again. If you, didn't, if you didn't get enough the first time, you can also share those with your neighbors and your friends. So I'm going to turn it over to Tony and we're going to get started and um, we're just going to go through just a couple of um, key points of each of those presentations. And if you have questions, you're welcome to either unmute, you can put those into the chat box. Um, you can turn your video on or off if you'd like, um, however you want to do it. This is pretty informal. We're just here to answer your questions. So, uh, Tony, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, you're going to run the slides, Amy? Yes, I will run the slides. And actually, before we jump right into Tony, I do want to um, take a second to let you know about other extension resources that we have and who Extension is. Um, CSU Extension is a is the outreach arm of Colorado State University. Um, we our job is to take what the university um, discovers in their research process and get it out to you guys in the public. So everything we do is science based and research based. Um, but we also run a lot of great programs, the, the Master Gardener program, you've probably heard of 4-H, um, agriculture programs, community development, and so much more. Um, you can find more information from CSU Extension on a lot of different topics um, at extension.colostate.edu. Now I'm going to turn it over to Tony, and yes, I will run the slides for you, Tony. Excellent. All right. Cool. So, um, uh, you know, if you watch my video, um, you know, uh, we pretty much covered the basics of, of lawn care. Uh, you know, we could go on for hours and hours on this topic, but uh, I think sometimes you make uh, lawn care overly complicated and they think about it too much. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, really, if you, if, you, if you mow at the right height and frequency and you fertilize once or twice a year, and the biggest thing is how, how to irrigate a lawn properly, um, you can have a pretty darn good lawn. Um, because we are in such a dry climate, uh, the way you irrigate, uh, the quality of your irrigation system really um, has a profound impact on the quality of the lawn, whether you have brown spots or uh, that, that type of thing. So, um, most people have in-ground automatic irrigation systems, and I think those are great because it makes it easy to water lawn, but it, it can also make it easy to ignore and not pay attention to the watering of the lawn. Um, and so that comes to the amount of water that people often apply too much. Um, it comes to, I have these brown spots in my lawn and people think it's disease or insects and it's almost, almost, almost always water in Colorado when we have uh, 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 lawn problems. So that's an important thing to remember. Uh, so, um, you know, what's it take to have a nice lawn in Colorado? Again, just doing the basic stuff, you know, mow as tall as, as, as you can tolerate, uh, you know, three inches is better than two and a half, three and a half is better than three. So the taller you can mow the lawn, the, the healthier it's gonna be. Um, you know, if you do have a chance to, to start a new lawn or you're building a new house, and that, that's a great opportunity to put the best grass species in there um, at the beginning. Uh, if you choose the wrong grass at the beginning, of a landscape project, you're living with that grass for a while. So um, take the time to do your homework on grass selection if you do have that opportunity to plant a new lawn. Um, and again, you know, just, uh, you know, we've got all kinds of fact sheets on when's the best time to fertilize your lawn and how much and that type of thing. Uh, something here in Colorado, we don't have the best soils as you probably noticed, uh, whether you're doing lawns or your vegetable garden or whatever. Uh, so soil compaction can be a problem. So aerating that lawn once or twice a year uh, does great things for the quality of your lawn. Um, you know, and then, then pest problems are almost always, almost always in some way uh, related to the way that we water, either 
skips and we get certain diseases or overwatering and we get other types of diseases and the, the, the way you water can lead to the type of weeds you get. So um, uh, again, really pay attention to the water. It, it's, it, it potentially causes so many problems for lawns, but it can also solve so many of the problems you see in our lawns. Um, so again, uh, the basics and most lawn problems aren't insects, even though we do have Japanese beetle here. Most lawn problems aren't diseases. Uh, our, our two biggest ones I consider to be water problems. And when we correct the watering on those, those, those problems go away. So, um, and here's, here's, here's a couple, this is such, these are such uh, frequent occurrences in our lawns here. The bottom one is a disease that is a result of overwatering just that watering every day or too much or just constantly keeping the lawn uh, very wet. And then the top one is kind of the opposite. It's getting dry spots and that's because there's an irrigation head in the green spot that's too low. Uh, so what sometimes people do is they'll over irrigate the entire lawn to get that poor coverage area green. And then that means that 90% of the lawn is getting overwatered. So. Uh, again, our problems are, are low heads, crooked heads, heads that don't pop up, they don't turn, they're plugged. Um, you, you really should be doing maintenance on your irrigation system, just, just the way you would, well, the way we recommend you change the oil in your car fairly frequently. Um, and if you don't uh, maintain your irrigation system, you're going to have skips. It, it doesn't matter what the quality was when it was installed. If you don't ma maintain and monitor your irrigation system, you're going to get uh, uh, problems with that system eventually. So, so really pay attention to the water, how often you water, how much you water. Um, and we've got this nice little uh, uh, graphic that uh, this applies anywhere really in Colorado, unless you maybe go up into a Vale or Aspen where the seasons are much shorter. So then you cut May and October off there. But um, uh, this, this works anywhere in, in, in Colorado. And the, the main thing to take away from this is that the hotter it gets, more frequently we have to water. That totally makes sense to most people. Uh, the thing that people don't think about though, is that the type of irrigation headed you have in your lawn should govern your run times. So the, the ones that are pop-up sprays, they just pop up and they don't turn. You just have water shooting out of those heads. Those put a lot of water out in a very short amount of time. Uh, so you would run those um, much shorter run times than the ones that uh, come up and they turn very slowly. You have to run those, those, uh, those moving heads. Um, uh, and the stream rotors uh, are, are a type, kind of a hybrid of both, but they have a moving uh, uh, part of their head. Those, those heads put water out very, very slowly, which is a good thing. It gives the water a chance to get uh, soaked into our, our soils, which otherwise um, the, the water can run off with the pop-up spray. So um, then the other thing that, in that graphic that was important was that we emphasize what we call soak cycling. You know, splitting your run times in half. And so instead of running, running uh, even your rotor one time for 40 minutes, do two times for 20 minutes. And you just get much better water infiltration. You get more uniformity. Um, that's just, it's just a better way to water. So just following this graphic uh, can really help you save a lot of water. And at the same time, have a fairly nice green lawn. So so pay attention to the water and uh, a, lot of, a lot of lawn problems just kind of take care of themselves. I did mention the importance of uh, aerification and you can see it, and it, it most people don't see this. They, they see the mess on top of the lawn. They say, what kind of benefit can this provide? But if you, if you can uh, uh, you know, use the soil sampler like we do when we're looking at soil problems and this is what you see um, uh, below ground when you make those holes in the lawn, those roots, grow more deeply into those holes. And granted, we're not making really deep holes. We don't want to do that in our urban landscapes, not like you can do in a golf course or an athletic field, but anything you can do to make those roots a little bit deeper and to get a little more air in, uh, into that soil. And it just makes the root systems happier and happy roots make for a happy lawn. So 
cultivate your lawn at least once a year. And then finally, our main problems, our, our most common uh, pest problems um, are, are weeds. And it, it doesn't matter how good of a turf manager you are, you're going to get an, an occasional weed in your lawn um, because our soil is full of weed seeds. So anytime you get a worn area, so if you have a dog that likes to dig or creates paths running up and down the, uh, the fence line or whatever, um, or you you have a husband or wife that likes to take divots out in the backyard practicing their, their wedge shots. Uh, anytime you open the soil up, um, you're going to have generally some other plant come in there that you don't like. And that's why we call them weeds. So uh, the, the best defense against weeds, herbicides, it's having a healthy lawn. As long as that, that lawn is nice and thick and healthy, um, you're not going to have weeds. So uh, just just follow those those general weed man or uh, turf management principles and you really will have very little need for herbicides so that's just a quick overview of of, of lawn care uh watch the video again i know it was that good uh you'll want to watch it again um and I think my email address is somewhere in that video uh so uh, send me send me emails I've, I've already gotten a few from folks that have watched that video so send me those questions that may not have been answered by that video what we'll do is we'll go ahead and Allison, if you want to do the quick overview of trees and shrubs, and then I'll do the quick overview of water wise. And then let's just take questions on all three subjects at the same time. That way we know that we're not going to um, get behind on questions. So keep throwing your questions in the chat if you've got them. Um, we can build those up and get ready. And Allison, I'm going to turn it over to you to give just a quick overview of what we covered in trees. Super, thanks, Amy. Hi, everybody. I'm Allison O'Connor. I'm with Larimer County Extension. I'm also the current chair of the Windsor Tree Board, so very excited to be serving in both roles. So let's just review the basics of tree and shrub selection and a little bit more about how we can care for our trees. So it is tough, obviously, to be a tree here in Colorado. There's no shortage of obstacles that our little trees face, whether it's soil, whether it's the weather that's just so inconsistent. We have a lot of wind. And then obviously your soils, depending on where you live, if you're in a newer development or if you're in an old part of Windsor, that can really make a difference too. Um, our soils in general tend to be alkaline. So they're above seven on the pH spectrum. What that means is that sometimes nutrients aren't always readily available. And sometimes we see issues like iron chlorosis as a result of those soils. We also get these crazy temperature extremes and then um, to top it all off, we have a short-ish growing season. Can you do the next slide, perfect. So what we need to remember with our trees is that they really are an investment. And obviously without our trees in our community, it would look very, very different. We have some pressing insects that are going to affect our urban canopy in the coming years, whether that's emerald ash borer, Japanese beetle, there's a couple others that others are looking for. And what we need to remember is that success post planting should be everyone's concern. We should always care about how these trees survive. We should always care about what they can do and also maintaining them is so important. And so the planting process is one part of it, but then also making sure that we care for them is equally important. So when we are planting trees, if you're looking to get out and plant trees during Arbor Day in just a couple of weeks, and remember everybody, uh, the Windsor Tree Board does have a tree sale going on right now. You can actually buy up to three trees for your property. They are at a great price of around $70. Our forester, Ken Kawamara, picked out some great species that aren't as common in our landscapes. And so you can get that information either online, hopefully Tony or Amy can type that into the chat, or you can obtain that information from the rec center. So trees will be available through the middle of April with a pickup on, I believe, April 17th, that's a Saturday. So tree planting 101, when you get your tree, no matter where you buy it from, there's just a couple important things. So the first most important thing is to make sure that that base of the planting hole is nice and firm. 
We don't want it fluffy. We don't need to add a lot of organic matter. We do want that firm so that when we're watering and as that tree settles, because natural settlement is going to occur, we want that tree to be planted at the proper depth. The hole should be about three times as wide and then the tree should sit just slightly above grade. So what that means is that those structural roots, if you can envision those big buttress roots that we have with the trees, they should be sitting right at grade. That would ensure that they have the proper oxygen levels because roots need oxygen in order to function. It will also give them opportunity to get any moisture that we get, which Ken mentioned, we don't have a lot of it uh, compared to Ohio or the Midwest. So we do need to usually supplement our trees with moisture. Plant selection is a huge part of that too. A couple other things is that during the planting process, keep any sort of backfill off the top of that root ball. And then also that goes for mulch as well. But you do want to mulch, absolutely. Mulch can be your best friend in Colorado landscapes. You just don't want it on top of the root ball because it can actually interrupt the flow of water down into the root ball itself. So there's the quick and dirty tree planting 101 and there's lots of other information if you need help with that. When we're looking at selecting our trees and shrubs, diversity is the most important. So I mentioned emerald ash borer, and ash is a big tree that we have here in our Windsor landscapes. So our forester estimates that about 15% of our total trees are ash. They are making decisions as to which trees the town will actually treat, which trees will be removed, but just know that if you do have an ash in your landscape, it's time to make a decision. While emerald ash borer hasn't been found in Windsor, it hasn't been found in Weld County yet. It has been confirmed in Larimer County, both southwest of Berthet and on the north side of Fort Collins. So it is only a matter of time, unfortunately. But if you're looking to replace or add trees to your landscape, diversity is a big thing. And then obviously we want to also think about trees that do well in our climate, and that's the natural climate. So trees that are more drought tolerant, they can be native, but we should be looking at trees that can do well with periods of drought. And so that may not be those trees that you grew up with. I'm from Minnesota. So red maples and sugar maples, a lot of those trees aren't necessarily the best choices for Colorado landscapes. Also think about trees that just do well in our soils, the cold hardiness, and then obviously the mature size. So when you plant a tree, it is not easy to move it around uh, if it gets too big for a space. So do make sure that you are planting for the mature size of that tree, even if it's a tree that you're not going to maintain for its lifetime, you do want to make sure that it has the proper space to grow. And finally, to wrap things up with shrubs, I think shrubs sometimes get ignored, poor little shrubs, but they are so important. And what they do is they help frame the home. And so oftentimes shrubs are planted around the foundation of a house. That doesn't make sense to put a tree in those areas, but shrubs can really help soften some of the corners. They can add a lot of backbone to the landscape. And shrub versus tree, it's a little bit, you know, the details are kind of just you know, fuzzy, uh, but just know that a tree basically is a, tr uh, a plant that has a single stem while shrubs have multi stems. But we can have shrubs that are 15 to 20 feet tall. There are some nice junipers that would fit that bill. And then we have some trees that only get to be 10 to 12 feet tall. But shrubs can really add a lot. They have some great spring color. We're going to start seeing lilacs really soon and they can really do a lot. And there's some wonderful foliage shrubs as well. Nine bark comes to mind. Nine bark is fairly drought tolerant, has some great foliage color, also has some nice blossoms. So don't forget the shrubs, they're equally important to trees and they can add a lot to your landscape. I think that's it for me. So we'll go yeah. to Amy. Great, all right. So I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of what you learned during the, during the water wise landscaping video. And so I always like to start out with some stats. Um, this is just to get you thinking more about water wise landscaping. Um, across Colorado, generally we're looking at eight to 15 inches of precipitation a year. Most of that comes in the winter time and it's not when we need it when our plants are growing in the summer. Um, most households use up to 50% of their annual water supply to water the landscape. 
Some of us are on city water to water our landscape. Some people have um, maybe an HOA that has a water supply, but you know, regardless, that water is very limited here in Colorado. Our, as you guys know, in Windsor, wow, are we growing. Um, our increasing population is just gonna continue to put more and more demand on that water supply. We're having to come up with new water sources across um, this front range of Colorado. And Windsor's not alone, we're all growing. Um, and then, you know, if you do have a nice, well thought out water smart plan, you really can save your outdoor water use by up to 60%, which is just really great. Um, there is this term called xeriscaping. It's not zero with the, like, like the number zero, it's actually um, xeriscape, which means dry. And there is a process to how you can convert a landscape over into xeriscape or build a new landscape. And um, that is available online and it's a seven step process. You just need to come up with a plan. It'll, it'll talk to you about how to improve your soil, how to limit those turf areas. You know, when you're going to a water wise landscape, we're not saying that you have to eliminate that bluegrass lawn, but you can limit the area of that lawn to where it's used. Um, oftentimes we have the grass right up to the fence line and most of us don't walk near the fence. So those areas could be turned into some water smart plantings. Um, and then that turf area shrunken down a little bit. Tony mentioned irrigating efficiently. Um, plant selection is really important. I'm gonna cover that in, in another slide. Um, mulching can help you conserve water as well. That's going to hold the water into the soil. Um, and then you'll always have to maintain a landscape, whether it's a, a low maintenance landscape, a xeriscape, um, or, or a lawn, you're going to have to do just a little bit of work to keep it looking good. Um, I mentioned plant selection. This is step five of that process. And I just want to highlight that there are some really great resources out there for you guys to find good plants that are low water using that do well in our climate. The first being Plant Select. That's a program between CSU and, Den and Denver Botanic Gardens where they are trialing plants for a region, this entire region. So from West Texas all the way up to Montana to find out what grows well in our high elevation, um, low water step climate is what they call that. Um, Resource Central is another good uh, resource for you. They have a program called Garden in a Box, and I did check this morning in Windsor. You guys are, are uh, qualified for a $25 discount on the Garden in a Box program. It's where you just buy a box of plants, and it actually comes in flats, not a box, but it comes with a design, and you can put those out in your landscape water them the first year to get them established, but then you can really back off on the water and that will be a low water planting in the future. And they're beautiful. They've got uh, groups of plants that are for shade. They've got colorful Colorado plants. They've got pollinator habitat boxes. So um, lots of good um, options there. And then always come to uh, CSU. We've got plenty of resources on our website. And if you're into the native plants, there is a Colorado Native Plant Society for you to check out with some more options as well. Um, I mentioned in my class online that you can do a little bit of water harvesting. You can do that either actively with a rain barrel or you can do that passively by creating um, these rain gardens where you divert the water into a area from your downspout. Um, and that just helps with stormwater runoff as we build more and more houses and more and more driveways and more and more roads, we're going to see more runoff and we really want to be capturing the water on our properties and not letting it run into the street if we can. So that's just good for the environment. Um, but also these can be really attractive as well, these rain gardens. And then as I mentioned, selecting those plants that are good for a water wise landscape um, in the picture here, we've got ice plant. This is a plant that comes from South Africa, um, but there's a, several different um, varieties of that, that you can get as a, a nice colorful ground cover. We've got the columbine, the state flower. This one in particular is called Remembrance from Plant Select. And I just wanna leave you with the fact that you can really have a very attractive low water landscape like the one you see in this picture here, um, just full of color, but I doubt that this has an irrigation system. Again, always irrigate the first year to get it established. You might have to do that by hand, but then after that, you can really start to back off. So with that, let's go ahead and see what kind of questions you all have. And I'm gonna start with one that came into the um, 
there was a, an online survey you could fill out. And this one comes from uh, Sue. And she wanted to know, Tony, from you, what are the types of things that you would have to do in the spring to take care of your irrigation system? In the fall, we do things like blowouts, but what should we be doing in the spring before we turn our irrigation system back on? Well, wow, that's a good question. Um... I mean, really, it is turning it on. And if you know how to do that, with if you had it blown out properly, um, you really should have that person come back and turn all those valves that are supposed to be open, open or closed uh, so you don't like flood your basement and things like that. Um, but uh, get, get that system fired up and then just go station by station and turn the thing on and, and watch, watch the heads come up. And don't just watch for them to come up watch them to make sure they're operational, that they're actually turning full circle where they're supposed to be going full circle, um, that they're coming out of the ground uh, vertically, that they're not crooked when they come up, um, that they're not plugged. You know, stuff happens over the winter. You know, they get stepped on, get walked on. Um, just a lot of minor things can happen to a sprinkler head over the winter. Uh, frost heating. Some of them get pushed up too high and then you might hit them with a mower. Others sink too low and then they don't come up properly. So, so it is a good time to really make sure all the stations turn on, all the valves are working, um, that type of thing. And, all, and especially all the heads are, are turning and not plugged in that type of thing. So I would say that's, that's the main thing is just to make sure everything's operational. Um, and then Another thing is just to refresh your uh, familiar with your your uh, irrigation control clock um, and how to uh, turn it on and off and how to seasonally adjust it. You know, it may it may be set to water like it's July. You don't want to be doing that in in May. So uh, look at the run times to make sure they're reasonable run times. That type of thing. If you've got a uh, a lot of people have rainfall uh, shutoffs. And those things, they in reality, they only last maybe two or three years in, in Colorado, and unless you maintain them. So the dirt and dead insects and all kinds of stuff gets into those, and they don't work properly if they're dirty. So uh, check your, your, rain, your rain cutoff if you have one on, on your system. So I, I would say those are the, probably some of the main ones. Unmute. All right, good, good. Thanks so much, Tony. Um, Allison, a question came in for you as well, and maybe even me too. I cover some fruit tree stuff in my line of work, um, but someone asked that they are new to the area and have a peach tree in their backyard, and they heard that, let me read this here, they heard that it needs special treatment, especially in the spring. Can you comment on, on this? Maybe also um, other options that they might have? Sure. So peach trees, I, I kind of consider them almost a holy grail of Colorado landscapes. And down here in the Front Range, our climate sometimes is just a little too erratic to get consistent peaches. We're over on the Western Slope where they have more balmy weather, if you will, uh, they can get more consistent crops. But here what we find is that you might get a peach crop once every five to eight years, depending on the temperature swings in the spring and that's the biggest thing is that you really can't control when these plants decide to bloom and then you really can't control how cold it gets. So last year I know that freeze that we had right around Easter really caused severe damage to most of our fruit trees down here in the front range. But for peach, what you do need to remember is that it's not a drought tolerant plant and so regular consistent watering is key. It also does not do well in a lawn. So if you have it planted in a lawn, I would suggest that you remove the turf from the base of the tree and add some mulch instead. It's kind of a, it's kind of a tree wimp, if you will. It, it doesn't do well with competition. And so those two things are really important, making sure it gets adequate water and then just doing good cultural practices. And I'll throw it to Amy because she actually can advise a little bit on the pruning and maintenance. Yeah, you know, one of the things with peach trees is the way that they're shaped, they have, um, typically they have four to six big long branches that kind of, and I don't know, I always, I always try to use my, 
my hands to show what I'm talking about. <laughs> they have these like vase shaped um, branches that go out at angles and there's not really a good central leader of that tree. And so you've got all those branches coming into one spot and it puts a lot of stress on those branches. And once you start getting a fruit load on those peach trees, especially if we have that one year where it's just beautiful outside and um, we don't have that spring freeze to kill off the flower buds, you're gonna have a big crop of peaches. So my advice as a as a backyard peach grower, if you can, um, and don't, you know, don't um, put yourself at risk for safety or anything by ladders, but if you can pull off maybe every third little tiny peach fruit that you see when they're about an inch in size, it's gonna really reduce the load on those branches. And you might be saying, but I wanna eat those peaches. Well, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a lot of little peaches instead of a few really big peaches. So um, better to have a big peach and, and less of them than to have a bunch of little tiny fruit or tiny peaches that probably aren't gonna taste very good. So I would do that. I would pick off every, maybe every third peach um, once they get to be about, oh, maybe the size of a quarter or so. Great. Okay, let's see if we've got any other questions coming in. Okay, Janine has a question. Um, what are recommended fruit trees for the area? Oh, that's a good question, Janine. Um, so we are, so I should mention, I guess I'll cover this. Is that okay, Allison? <laughs> or do you wanna jump in? Um, there are some good fruit trees. So we just talked about those late spring frosts and freezes, and really the best fruit trees are ones that can get around that, that are gonna be blooming a little bit later. Peaches bloom really early. So really, I would say um, apples are a pretty sure bet. You can get apples almost every year in Colorado. Last year, we didn't have um, apples because of that, light, that late frost, but hopefully this year we will. Um, cherries are another one you could try. Actually, some people don't know this, but Northern Colorado used to be the number one cherry growing industry in the country um, back in the 1950s, 40s, and in that time period, um, a, a hard, hard freeze took those out along with some changes in the market, but cherries are a really nice option and they have pretty blooms. They do, there are some insects and diseases they can get. Um, Allison, you might want to jump in on that, um, but those would be another good option. Also, you could think about plums. Um, nectarine, yeah, I, see, I just see Janine said a nectarine, but yeah, you had to replace it. That's very closely related to those peaches. So any other trees that I didn't mention, Allison? Um, I would throw crab apples in there. If you're a fan oh, yeah. of crab apple jelly or yeah. you want to do any of that, the crab apples are very similar to our apples and they would, you can grow them as an ornamental, you can grow them as a fruit crop. Just depends on what you want to do. Okay. Yeah, good. All right. Any other questions? You guys are free to unmute yourselves if you want. This is, as we mentioned, very um, informal. We just want to answer your questions today. If not, I've got one I want to ask. <laughs> so I'll wait though to see if anybody has one first. Allison was going to address how to keep our old trees if oh. we do more zero scaping and less lawn. Great question. Yeah, that is a great question, Janine. So if you do decide to convert your lawn or make your landscape a little more water efficient or even reduce the amount of irrigation that you're giving your lawn or surrounding landscape, you do need to think about your trees. So uh, I think Tony agrees with me on this is that, you know, your trees are probably the most valuable as aspect of your landscape, especially if they're mature and old. Um, it's much, much easier to replace a lawn than it is to replace a 30 year old tree. Um, so if you do convert your lawn or you start adjusting water to make things a little more dry, you will want to give special attention to those mature trees simply because they are used to receiving regular irrigation if that's how they have been treated for their life. And just going from regular irrigation to cutting it off by half or a third or whatever can really cause a lot of stress. So if, you, if we ever go into water restrictions where we're not allowed to water our lawns, I have never seen a water restriction where it says you cannot water trees. That said, the easiest way to water your trees is to usually just turn on your sprinkler system. So it's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, but if you can provide extra water with either a drip irrigation system, if you're taking out your lawn totally, 
or if you can use a hose and sprinkler, that's going to be a benefit. So try to aim to water your trees really thoroughly at least a couple times a month during the growing season and then at least once a month uh, during fall and winter, if that's possible. Amy, Tony, any other advice on that? Um, I think, I, yeah, I think the only thing the only thing I would add was is uh, I'm a huge advocate of, of large mulch circles around trees because one of the problems with trees when they get older or a problem for the turf is that the shade usually causes problems for the turf. So instead of trying to force the issue and try to get healthy grass under the tree, just replace that that turf with mulch. Um, the tree is going to be happier. It's going to be easier than trying to grow grass there. Um, but don't remove those irrigation heads. You still want to be irrigating. Even if even if the head pops up in the mulch, that's fine. Um, but uh, I, I like seeing mulch around trees, uh, less and less grass. This kind of brings up a. A second question around this is a lot of times people uh, plant new trees and they use drippers to water those trees. And then as those trees get older, um, those drippers just aren't adequate. And so you, if you are doing a drip irrigation, you need a lot of drippers and they need to be out where the edge of the, the leaves are, which is called the drip line. So as that tree grows, you're gonna need to make sure you're watering further and further away from the trunk of that tree. Um, any other thoughts on that, Tony? I know that- um, Yeah, and that, that, would be, that would be one thing to do is to, uh, you can convert heads to drip and so if you do have a head in the mulch part of that uh, tree ring, um, you can convert that individual head to drip and, and then distribute that drip throughout the, the, the drip line or under, within the drip line of the tree. But that is, that is very true. A lot of, we, we see that all the time is that new trees are put in, there's a, there's a drip ring like six or eight inches away from the trunk of that young tree and it never moves for the life of that tree. Um, yeah. And that's that's really not helping that tree very much. So you do have to change drip systems or you should change drip systems for trees as those trees mature, so. Yeah, yeah. You always gotta remember that the root system is growing just as much as the top of that tree is growing. Um, Brent asked a question in the chat. I think this one might go to me and Alice. I don't know, to all of us really. Um, I'm new to the area. What's with rock as opposed to mulch in my landscapes? I'm going to ask Allison first to, to jump in on this because I know she just loves rock. <laughs> oh my gosh, Brenda, what a great question. And um, I do not like rock that much, actually. So <laughs> I, I feel that sometimes rock is used because they think that that's what they should use. And I think there's also a belief that rock is easier to maintain. I would disagree with all of that on so many levels. So Brenda, for you, what I would say is that if you're looking to improve your soils and if you have plants in the area, then wood mulch is your best option. Wood mulch will break down, it will add some organic matter to the soils and wood mulch is far better at suppressing weeds than rock is. Um, what we've seen is sometimes rock can heat up landscapes. Um, if you obviously have been to Phoenix or anywhere where they use rock more commonly, it's a whole lot hotter than wood mulch. Now, wood mulch we know has its issues. It can blow away, it needs to be replaced. Um, I'm hoping that with the storm damaged trees, maybe the town will give us free mulch uh, coming up. Maybe they'll have big piles where we can utilize that. Um, around certain plants, I will say that pea gravel or certain rock is better. So for some of the natives, for some of the rock garden plants, that is a better choice. But overall, if you can utilize wood mulch, it's going to be better for your landscapes. Amy? Yeah, and so this is where Allison liked, and I like to kind of go back and forth a little bit. I, I have some rock mulch. I, I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> I think as Allison mentioned, there is a difference though between just rock and then what we call like a gravelly type of mulch um, that you can get the really fine textured pea gravel or even one that's called squeegee that's a little bit smaller. And that is really gonna be um, used in more of those 
xeric type landscapes because again as Allison mentioned some of those plants won't thrive in a very um, wet area or even an area with rich soil or mulch. So um, what I think is a good thing to do is really mix your mulch types up um, not together but in different places <laughs> so that you can delineate some different spaces. Um, I have some rain gardens where I'm diverting my rainwater from my gutters down along the side of the property where I've got a planting of grasses and other plants and for those areas I actually use cobble which is a very large rock just to keep that water flowing and moving in the direction I want it. Um, but then there's other places where I do have the, the um, wood mulch around my trees and around some of my shrub plantings. And then there's other areas, again, where I have that pea gravel um, squeegee type mulch where I've got penstemons and um, some natives. Um, I'm drawing a blank of, this, of what all the natives I have, penstemons and agastiches or hyssops and salvias, and I've got those more in my gravelly mulch area. So, you know, it is it is kind of a personal thing too. Some people like it, some people don't, but there's benefits um, to wood mulch that rock mulch doesn't have, and then there's benefits to rock mulch that wood mulch doesn't have. So, um, yeah, you can have a, so a love-hate relationship say, with all of them. <laughs> I will say there was a really cool study done by the Morton Arboretum in Illinois, and they were looking at ways to improve really compacted soils and what we would consider yeah. to be really bad soils. And they did several treatments and wood mulch came out on top. So if you do, honestly, if, if you're going back to importance of using mulch around trees, whether they're young, whether they're mature, it does have a lot of great benefits. So I would say for sure use mulch around your trees and then the rest of your plants, you really have to get to know because Sometimes wood mulch can be too wet and um, some of your succulents, some of like ice plant may not do well in those situations, but um, it does help benefit the soil, I will say. So. And I'm gonna put in the chat, CSU has a fact sheet on mulches for home gardens and home grounds. And I'm gonna put that link in, excuse me, in the chat for you, Brenda. What other questions do you guys have today? Not so much a question, but I'm just going to put the garden in the box link in the chat. I don't hey, know if thanks, there's any rebates left for the town. Last time I checked, okay. wasn't. I just checked and they said there was three, but then I kind of tried to check out and then Windsor wasn't listed anymore. A lot of them are sold out, but I would encourage anybody that doesn't have one to get one because they do look really good. Thanks, Leaf. And you know, that brings up another good point. Um, if you are trying to find a lot of these low water plants, similar to the ones that you would find in the garden in a box. So let's say the one that you want is sold out, but you say, you know, I, I still like the plants that are in and I want to go find them somewhere else. You're going to find these low water, xeric, um, plant select and native type plants. Those are going to be found at your local garden centers. It's very, it's, you might find one or two here and there at your big box stores, but really your local garden centers are going to be a much better resource for those types of plants. I would also say that's probably for uh, trees as well, um, because trees are very um, specific to the environment that they're grown in. And a lot of times our local nurseries are sourcing those trees from northern, northern locations. Um, bringing in red buds from places like Oklahoma or, you know, harsher climates, whereas your big box stores, they might be pulling in trees from the south um, or the southeast U.S. or California. And so if you're looking for specific stuff and um, stuff that's good for Colorado, support your local nurseries. I think that they're going to be your better bet. All right. What other any other questions out there? Yeah, I've got a question for Tony. Tony, in your irrigation slide, uh, you showed the, the sprayer type heads and then also the uh, small rotors. Is that a fairly easy change out to do something like that? I mean, we've got Rainbird. We inherited a house that has uh, Rainbird sprinklers. So, and they're just, they just go all over the place. Yeah, the, uh, the pop-up sprays can be very easily converted to what we call stream rotors. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you don't have to buy an entire head. You can just unscrew the 
the top of the, uh, uh, the, the, the nozzle assembly and then replace it with the, uh, the equivalent um, uh, stream rotor. So you have to do a little homework. Um, one thing I would do is I would, if, if you've got Rainbird pop-up sprays, I would convert to the, the Rainbird version of the, of the stream rotor. Um, but check your spacing because they, they have different stream rotors, different throw radius. Uh, so if you've got short throws, you want to get the short throw stream rotors or the, the long throw ones. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's a pretty darn easy way to turn what I would call maybe a, an average or below average irrigation system into a pretty darn efficient one. Mm -hmm. Do they, uh, do the stream rotors, are they, uh, can you adjust the areas that it actually does rather than going a full 360? Yeah, well, they'll, they'll have 360s. They'll have full 360s and then they'll have adjustable arc ones. Yeah, okay. and it's, it's a pretty easy adjustment. And they all have nice uh, YouTube videos now where it, because to read how to adjust it and then actually watch a video on how to do it, and you go, oh yeah, this is easy. But to read about it, 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 it's kind of like a foreign language. So watch the video on how to adjust those those uh, adjustable arc ones. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And a, a good gotta... thing with that, Greg, sorry, Amy, before we get to no, vegetables, go is for it. Go if for you it. decide to convert your heads, make sure you convert the entire zone, um, yes. not just one or two heads on that zone, but do the whole thing because otherwise it's going to be like my yard, which is a disaster. <laughs> yeah, and remember, you're going to have to you're going to have to uh, double or triple your run times if you if you are irrigating correctly with the pop up sprays, which means pretty short run times. You're going to have to easily double or triple the oh. run times for the stream rotors because they put water out very very slowly. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Great. Okay, we had a question come into the chat from Brenda. Any thoughts on vegetable gardening? Um, the season season too short, don't bother? That's the question. Um, I would say, no, I think you can bother. I think you can try this out, Brenda. Um, I swapped out my background picture just for your question. Um, I think one way to really help extend your season is to, to use raised beds. And so this is in my little tiny backyard that I have. Um, I'm just north of Windsor and Severance. And uh, I have just about 15 feet from my, uh, my back window to the fence. And so I put in a couple of these raised beds. These are three feet by eight feet. And what you can do then is you can put these structures over them to create season extension. Um, this is just half inch PVC pipe over top of some rebar that slipped in, you know, just slipped right over the rebar and then that's driven into the ground to kind of hold it all in place. And then I've got it bracketed to the side of that raised bed. And I can swap out things like shade cloth um, in the height of the summer when it's really hot and baking down on those vegetables too much. You can get things like sun scald on your peppers or your tomatoes. But then in the winter, or not, well, not winter, I shouldn't say winter, but in the spring and in the fall, if you want to get out early into the garden, you can swap this out with um, plastic, like a six mil plastic that you can get from the hardware store. And that's going to um, create that greenhouse effect inside of that bed. And then you can grow some cool season crops. Vegetable gardening is, um, there's a lot to unpack there. I want to, and I'll put it in the chat. I want to draw your attention to a new program that CSU developed last year called Grow and Give. Um, we were all stuck at home during the pandemic. And so um, we wanted, as agents, we wanted to figure out a way that we could still help our communities, which is what we're used to doing while still being at home. And we created this program called Grow and Give that teaches people how to grow vegetables in Colorado, very specific information, and then also links those people up with local food banks, food pantries, neighbors in need, um, churches, you name it, whoever's collecting food for those that need it. And, um, and then you can report that back to CSU. And last year, in the pilot of that program, we had over 1,800 donations across the state of fresh produce to local people in need. And we had over 45,000 pounds donated and reported back to CSU. We just developed a new website for that program called Grow and Give. And there's a section on there called General Gardening Info. 
and also a crops A through Z section. And both of those have videos, fact sheets, um, infographics, you name it, of all the resources that come from CSU Extension. And again, that's all surrounding vegetable gardening. You don't have to give to be a part of that, um, to use that information. You don't have to sign up if you don't want to. The information is there, and then you can join the program if you feel like it. So I would encourage you, if you're thinking about growing vegetables in Colorado, to check that out. And Brenda, all I would say is that just watch um, the days to harvest. So that's usually available. Make sure it's, I would say, under 90 days, maybe even 100 days. Mm -hmm. we, we sometimes get those freak cold snaps in May. And then last year we had that really hard freeze in early September. So, and the days to harvest is from the time when you put the seedling in the ground. So you need to make sure that you have enough months of season to get that. But Tony uh, lives north of Fort Collins and does vegetable gardening. He's almost to the Wyoming border and he's also very successful with raised beds. Yeah, yeah. and it's, it's, the only, it's the only way I can really like grow tomatoes or, um, but I, I mean, I've grown watermelon and sweet corn, really long season stuff. But I, you know, I use row covering and I use black plastic mulch to warm the soil up. There's, there's a lot of tricks and all that's on the Grow and Give uh, website. There's so much information there that you, you could spend days reading everything that's on there. But uh, there's a lot of stuff that does specifically talk about um, prolonging or lengthening your growing season, uh, like like Amy's little hoops there on her raised bed. Yeah. Yeah. I heard, I heard there was a run on PVC pipe last year. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> hopefully it's better this year. Everyone started gardening last year, so that's great. Yeah, seeds this year. You know, one thing I would say, though, is if you're going to start gardening is, you know, even though we, we, we give classes on seed starting, it's going to be way easier just to go to a good local garden center and get transplants. Um, they have transplants for just about anything these days. Um, and what about starting your garden? What date? Allison likes this date. She starts about the 4th of July, I think. No. I do, pretty much. <laughs> no. uh, I have, so I have, I've lived here 15 years. I have been burned so many times by that plant on Mother's Day. So I actually wait until Memorial Day or even the beginning of June. And what I found is that my little garden, the soils are warmer. Things start to grow almost immediately. If the soils are too chilly, especially around mid-May, and if we have a lot of moisture, like it seems like we might, the soils are going to be a lot slower to warm up. So do watch those soil temperatures, but honestly, if you can wait just a week, 10 days, another two weeks, you're gonna have better success and you will still harvest the same time that people planted around Mother's Day. I promise, I promise. <laughs> and I would say though, that Allison does not have raised beds. I do not have raised beds, but I do a lot of containers. And so yeah. if you don't have a ton of space, every vegetable is available in a container variety, including sweet corn. I've heard it's yeah. okay. <laughs> that, that can be, you know, doing container vegetable gardening can be a, a good way to learn here in Colorado. Um, it's not a huge investment of time or whatever. And, and it's, uh, it's a way to learn how to vegetable garden. And you don't have weeds with, with container gardening. And if you need zucchini, hit up Janine. She lives over on Elm. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay. Yes, and all. Good. Thank you, Sue. Just um, private message me in the chat. Don't forget about your county master gardeners. Um, some of you might be in Larimer County. Some of you might be in Weld County. It doesn't matter. We both have very good master gardener programs, and they are there to answer all those questions questions that you have throughout the year. Um, they, you can send those in through email or phone right now. And um, thank you, Allison. I'll pop Weld Counties in there um, in just a second. But yeah, ask your master gardeners. You know, it's a free service. You just, you can send them photos and all kinds of stuff and they'll, they'll get you some good information back. So I'll put Weld Counties in there as well. All right. Yeah, Janine, do you want to mention Treasure Island, the gem of Windsor? I love Treasure Island. Yeah. Well, we do, we do teach and, you know, volunteer. We've got vegetables. We've got a big vegetable area. We harvested 700 pounds of 
of the butternut squash last year. So come on out and learn along with everybody else. It's also a great place to be if you're new in town. A lot of our volunteers have moved here from other areas of the country and they come out and they get to the point where it's kind of the newcomers club for gardeners. So join us out there. The, the way you volunteer is through the park and rec volunteer system. And our kickoff meeting is April 6th at 10 a.m. We'll have a Zoom kickoff. So just go to the park and rec and hit find their volunteer area and you could volunteer at Treasure Island. And just let me know, is the flyer showing? I just tried to share the new, yes. Yeah. So as Janine mentioned, Treasure Island has um, education that they offer. If you haven't been down there, you've got to go to Treasure Island. I could switch my background one more time and show you Treasure Island too, but I'll, 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 I'll try not to be too nerdy. Um, but we do have monthly classes. They're going to be every third Wednesday of the month from 10 to 11 a.m. pending good weather. Um, there is a link there that you can go to, but you can just search the um, recreation uh, website and it'll be under forestry. But every month we've got a different topic coming up and those are taught by master gardeners or agents, so CSU agents. Um, all right, let's see. I've got a couple more things on our PowerPoint here. Are there any other questions popping in? Have we answered everything so far? Good, okay, so last bit of business then. We'll let you all get back to your Saturday. Um, I mentioned the Treasure Island classes. We also have a lot more webinars coming up this, um, this year, um, starting with our Windsor Library, uh, the Clearview Library District partners with us along with the, Lo the Loveland Public Library to offer second Wednesday online classes. Um, these are all done through Zoom. Um, and typically, again, taught by Master Gardeners or Allison or myself or Tony. Um, I think Dr. Jim Klett will be teaching one of these this year as well. And so you can see that here under the Lunch and Learn Gardening series. You can register for those at csuhort.blogspot.com. Those are always fun and lots of good topics. And then for the spring season, um, CSU Extension is offering free garden webinars on Fridays at noon. Same place to register, you still go to csu.blogspot.com, click on gardening webinars there as well, and you'll get to those CSU Extension webinars. Those are taught by CSU Extension agents from across the front range. So even some people down in, you'll get some teachers down in Douglas County or Arapahoe County joining in for those as well. Um, in the chat, Allison saying also visit Sp Gardens on Spring Creek. Absolutely. Um, they're on Center Avenue there in Fort Collins, uh, just south of campus. So with that, I think that is what we've got for you today. We really want to thank the Town of Windsor and the Windsor Water and Sewer Board for sponsoring this class for you all. Um, they were kind enough to send this out in the mailers that you got your water bills in. I'm not sure how you all found out about the class today, but thank you so much for joining us. And just remember, if you have more questions, we are here to help you. Um, your master gardeners are here to help you. Your town board and your town um, water and sewer board are also here as well. So um, good luck to all of you in growing plants and landscapes in Colorado. Any last words, Tony, Allison, Greg, Ken? Um, Ken? No, thanks Good everyone weekend. for joining. Start your cleanup. Thank you yeah. all. You did a great job. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. All right. All right, everybody, take care, and we'll uh, maybe we'll do this again sometime, right? <laughs> so, right. All right. Have a great day, everyone. All right. Thank you, Bye. everybody. Bye.